Hello everyone, this is David Larson. I am the Associate Chair for Performance Improvement in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. And this is the Radiology Non-Interpretive Skills Review. Uh, this time we're looking at the American College of Radiology's Communication Practice Parameter. Uh, this is related to our review series of the American Board of Radiology's Quality and Safety Core Examination Study Guide. Um, the ACR Communication Practice Parameter is so important that uh, I thought it would be best to have a dedicated review of of this parameter. Um, so we're going to go through in the same format that we did on uh, the um, uh, study guide. Um, the purpose of these videos is to help individuals learn the material contained in the practice parameter for communication of diagnostic imaging findings. The target audience is practicing radiologists and radiologists in training. Um, and uh, recognizing that this material slowly reflects my understanding of the practice parameter. And so other disclaimers are that these videos are only meant to help viewers better understand the practice parameter. There are no boards-like test questions in this review. The opinions expressed in this review in no way represent those of the ACR, ABR, Stanford, or any other organization. Uh, they're my own opinions. And also, I would say I am not personally endorsing the claims and opinions contained in the practice parameter. I'm simply reviewing the material. So having gone through the uh, disclaimers, let's dive into the uh, questions. What we'll do is I'll just um, give you some questions about the practice parameters, some open-ended questions, and give you some time to uh, think of them or discuss them if you're in groups. If you want to pause, that's fine. And then I will go ahead and go through the answers. So let's go to the first question. Question one, does the ACR's practice parameter represent a legally binding document? And I think from the way that question was asked, you probably uh, came to the correct conclusion that no, it does not. Uh, specifically, the American College of Radiology and our collaborating medical specialty societies, as they say, caution against the use of these documents in litigation in which the clinical decisions of a practitioner are called into question. They also go on to say the ultimate judgment regarding the propriety of any specific procedure or course of action must be made in, by the practitioner in light of all the circumstances presented. Thus, an approach that differs from the guidance in this document standing alone does not necessarily imply that the approach was below the standard of care. However, a practitioner who employs an approach substantially different from the guidance in this document is advised to document in the patient record information sufficient to explain the approach taken. In other words, no, it doesn't represent a legally binding document, but if you're going to do something significantly different than this, then you had better document why you are doing something significantly different from this. Next question. An effective method of communication, according to the practice parameter, should have what three elements? And those elements contained in the in the parameter are number one, it should promote patient care and support the ordering physician and healthcare provider. Number two, be timely. And number three, minimize the risk of communication errors. Those are the three elements um, that an effective communication system or method should have. Next question: What three things should a request for imaging contain? A request for imaging or a, uh, an order for imaging should contain relevant clinical information, a working diagnosis, and pertinent clinical signs and symptoms. I know that may not happen very often, at least in many people's institutions, but in general, that's what it should contain, those three elements. Also, um, the practice parameter states that a specific clinical question to be answered may be helpful, and I would agree with that statement. Next question. Who should generate a radiology report? The answer is a physician. Specifically, the parameter says, it is not appropriate for non-physicians to provide interpretations and or generate diagnostic reports, either final or preliminary. Next question, what are the four suggested elements of a radiology report? Those four elements are demographics, relevant clinical information, body of the report, and impression or conclusion or diagnosis. Uh, demographic information uh, should include all of the above. Um, notice this doesn't necessarily have to be in the report itself. It could be in the metadata that's associated with the report, but it should be documented uh, somewhere in the medical record. 
Um, the body of the report should discuss procedures, materials, findings, potential limitations, clinical issues, comparisons. And then the impression um, should be brief. And every report should contain a, an impression or a conclusion unless it's very brief. Um, should give specific diagnoses when possible, differential when appropriate, follow-ups if uh, needed, and then any significant patient reaction should also be reported. Next question. Name the three three of the six principles of reporting for the final report. So there are six included in the parameter, name three of them. So the final report, the first principle, the final report is the definitive document of imaging results. Number two, it should be proofread. Abbreviations and acronyms should be limited. In other words, it should be uh, professional in appearance and not contain errors. Number three, it should be in compliance with appropriate regulations, so you should include the information you're supposed to include. Number four, it should be transmitted to the ordering provider. Um, so in other words, the radiologist um, has responsibility to get that information back to the ordering provider. However, the ordering provider also shares in that responsibility to make sure they get the information related to the order or the request for imaging they put in. Number five, when feasible, the final report should accompany transmittal of the images. So if you're going to send the images elsewhere, then the, the final report should be accompanying that, those images. And number six, the report should be archived as part of the medical, medical record according to state and federal regulations. You should have a, a, a medical record archiving system, either the PACS itself, the wrists, or the medical record system. Next question, discuss a few points about the preliminary report. Uh, so a few points about a prelim report. Um, it may be used to direct immediate patient management, uh, but it very likely contains limited or incomplete information and is not expected to contain all information in the final report. It may be communicated verbally, electronically, or in writing, um, but the communication should be documented and it should be reproduced into a permanent format and labeled as preliminary report. And then it should also be archived since it may have driven clinical decisions and any significant discrepancy between the preliminary and final interpretations should be reported as soon as possible, and documentation of that discrepancy should be incorporated into the final report. So that's a prelim report. In general, it's there if you have a wet read um, that allows for immediate uh, transmission of information um, quickly. That's for urgent situations. Okay, next question. When are non-routine communications warranted? Okay, well, I guess I just gave that away. Um, so this is where uh, you have findings that suggest a need for immediate or urgent intervention. And that includes the institution's critical values conditions. Um, so the institution should have a list of critical values. And um, so that's included in what may require immediate or urgent intervention. Um, also findings that are discrepant and where failure to act may adversely affect patient health. Um, so, for example, where there's a discrepancy with a preliminary report or a previously issued final report, if you come across that, give them a phone call. That's what we're talking about here is getting people on the phone or finding some other way to communicate with them outside of the standard report. Um, also, findings that may seriously affect the patient's health but may not require immediate action. So, for example, an acute infectious process or possible malignant lesions or other unexpected findings, uh, those are cases where you should get on the phone and make sure that that communication happens rather than just relying on the final report. Um, or, and this is particularly applicable to unexpected findings with, the potential, with a potential break in the continuity of care. So, for example, if the ED in the ED or the outpatient setting, if they're sending people home and it could be they could be lost to follow up, um, then it's important to uh, notify those individuals that there is, for example, a, a worrisome lung nodule that even though they're not going to do something about it, somebody needs to do something about it and somebody needs to uh, follow up on it. So they need to be notified of that. Next question, how should non-routine communications be documented? Uh, they are, according to the parameter, uh, best placed in the report or the patient's medical record. Um, they may be entered in a department log or a personal journal, um, but they should include the time, the method of communication, and the name of the person to whom the communication was delivered. So in general, it goes into the report or the EMR says, um, these were communicated at a specific time by telephone or in person 
and who with whom the communication was uh, shared. Next question, what methods are acceptable for non-routine communication? Uh, so the parameter says that it should be handled in the matter most likely to reach the attention of the treating or ordering provider in time to provide the most benefit to the patient. And so it's encouraged that a telephone call or in-person communication be used because that ensures the receipt of imaging findings. There are other forms of communication um, that may suffice, um, but other methods like text or fax or voice message or instant messaging or email may not guarantee timely receipt and also must be HIPAA compliant. And then if you can't confirm the receipt, it's still up to the radiologist to contact the clinician. They're not off the hook. They've got to close that loop. Next question, what are so-called informal communications and what does the ACR think of them? Informal communications include things like a curbside consult or a wet read or an informal opinion um, that may occur during clinical conferences or while in another activity or while reviewing an outside study. Uh, these may preclude immediate documentation they may occur in suboptimal viewing conditions. They may occur without comparison of prior exams or without accompanying reports or an adequate patient history. So the ACR says that informal communications carry inherent risk um, and that especially when ordering clinicians documentation may be the only written record. That's especially salient to curbside consults. So radiologists are encouraged to document these interpretations and specifically a system for reporting outside studies is encouraged. Next question, to whom should radiologists communicate findings when patients are self-referred? The answer is directly to the patient. The parameter says performing imaging on self-referred patients establishes a doctor-patient relationship that includes responsibility for communicating the results of imaging studies directly to the patient and arranging for appropriate follow-up. In other words, if they came straight to your practice, then you're their doctor and you need to act on those results and make sure that they have appropriate follow-up care. Next question, to whom should radiologists communicate findings when patients are referred to or referred by third parties like insurance companies, employers, federal benefits programs, and lawyers? And the answer is usually to the third party, but possibly to the patient. So the parameter says, regardless of the source of the referral, the interpreting physician has an ethical responsibility to ensure communication of unexpected or serious findings to the patient. Therefore, in certain, certain situations, the interpreting physician may feel it is appropriate to communicate the findings directly to the patient. Next question, what does the ACR think about communication policies in your department? This is not the best question, but I don't know how else to say it. Um, so uh, policy, they, in general, they, they like you to have policies. They, they um, like uh, departments to have policies. Uh, because a policy can provide guidance on the types of communications that are most critical, uh, the individuals responsible for delivering and receiving communications, and the most appropriate methods of communication. And then, in addition to having a policy, it's important that the written policy must be consistently followed and shared with those responsible for following those policies. Next question, what does the ACR think about making reports available to patients? And this is a quote from the practice parameter. The ACR recommends that all imaging reports be made readily available to the patient. And this may be through numerous ways, such as the posting of medical or posting of imaging reports through the use of web based a web based portal. Um, and whatever method should consider uh, number one, the best interest of the patient, and number two, the professional relationship between the patient and the ordering physician or the healthcare provider. In other words, do your best to try not to get in between that, but to rather complement their relationship. Okay, that is the final question. Uh, again, this is David Larson in the Stanford Radiology Department uh, with the Quality Improvement Team, and uh, thank you for your attention and best of luck.